I want to take as my text this morning that reading from the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. You can find that text on page 1080. If you're making use of the Pew Bible, page 1080, Acts chapter 1, and beginning at verse 15. And I'd like us to read that again so it's fresh in our minds. Acts chapter 1 and beginning at verse 15. And Luke, who wrote the Acts of the Apostles and the Gospel of Luke, in fact, to this Acts of the Apostles is a sequel to his Gospel. But he writes and he says, And in those days Peter, that's the Apostle Peter, stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was about 120 and he said, brothers, in the scriptures, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. And then notice verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, and Peter is attributing the book, or at least these quotations, from the Psalms to David. For it is written in the book of Psalms, quote, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. And so one of the men, Peter says, who has accompanied us during all the time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he, Jesus, was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two people, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and they said, You, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This morning I want to talk about the resilience of the church. The resilience of the church. Indeed, it was Jesus himself who said famously in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And our text today is also something that says something about the, the church's resilience. Indeed, one might have thought that uh, the evil that Judas did might have left an indelible mark and a, a lasting defect on the church and its apostolic foundation. But it didn't. And by the way, neither will any of the present day Judases be able to leave an indelible mark and in lasting defect on the church nor will they be able to thwart the ultimate triumph of him who said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I have to tell you, as I was reading this and thinking about this, this theme and this thought gives me hope. Now, in context... What our text describes is, is something that took place between the ascension of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, as I mentioned uh, as in the welcome, interestingly enough, according to the Christian calendar, Ascension Day was last Thursday. Ascension Day is always 40 days from Easter Day. And Pentecost is next Sunday. And Pentecost is always 50 days from Easter Day. That's why Ascension Day is always on a Thursday. You can do the math and you can look at the calendar. Just trust me. Has been so for 2,000 years. <laughs> and this is why our text this morning is traditionally appointed for this day, the seventh Sunday of Easter, the Sunday after the day of Ascension. 
In fact, to get some of this chrono chronology and, and the context for our text, I'd like you to back up in Acts, Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. And notice, the first book Luke writes, O Theophilus, this is perhaps the patron that was maybe in some way supporting or providing uh, for the writing of this account of the life, the, uh, that is, the Acts of the Apostles. In the first book, and he's referring to his, the Gospel of Luke, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up after he had given commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So he was raised, and he was with them for 40 days. And then he ascended. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, quote, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6, and so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, they were looking on, and he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. That's the ascension. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Verse 12, and they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. This happened on the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, and it was Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. If you count them, there's 11. And all of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women. That is a reference to the women that supported Jesus during his ministry. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Jesus' brothers. And then we come to our text. And in those days, Jesus stood up, or excuse me, Peter stood up among the brothers. That is, the fellow believers. I mean, we just noticed that there were women there as well. The company of persons being about 120. It may very well be because we're told at the end of the uh, Luke's account, in Luke chapter 24, that daily they were going to the temple. 120 people, that's quite a lot of people. It wouldn't have been a lot of people to fit in, into the temple precincts where they were going every day. And when they were there, the Spirit came. It may very well that that is the setting where this is taking place. Peter said, verse 16, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Verse 17, For Judas was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. And he made reference in verse 16 to what David said. In verse 20, he quotes it. Notice verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, and this is about Judas. May his camp, or as the New Living Translation has it, home, may his home become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it. Peter quoting from Psalm 69 and verse 25, which by the way is a curse. <laughs> May his home become desolate and may there be no one to dwell in it. It's a curse. Why was no one dwelling in it? Because he's dead, even at his own hand, as you recall. 
It's a curse, which, by the way, isn't so very different from what Jesus himself had said about Judas. Do you remember? In Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, and beginning at verse 21, and they're all at the Last Supper, as we refer, it, refer to it, the night on which he was betrayed, and he, as he instituted what we call Holy Eucharist. He said, Behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man. Woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Or Matthew 26, and verse 24, Jesus at the Last Supper saying, The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better if that man had not been born. That's a curse. Or in John 17, as we read it just moments ago, Jesus is praying to the Father. And he prays and he says, while I was with them, while I was with these disciples that you gave to me, I kept them in your name, those whom you have given me. I have guarded them. Not one of them was lost except the son of destruction. Or as we might put it, the man destined for destruction. And that, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Interesting. We often talk about the scriptures speak of Jesus. We don't often talk about the scriptures speak of Judas. And so Peter quotes Psalm 69 and verse 25 as a scripture descriptive of the fate of Judas. And then Psalm 109 and verse 8, quote, and let another take his office. And perhaps these are scriptures that Jesus himself had applied to Judas when after his resurrection and before his ascension, he was explaining to the apostles that seemingly on several different occasions all the things that had to happen to him in order that the scriptures, with regards to him, his life, his suffering, even his rising from the dead, must be fulfilled. And maybe in the course of that, he mentioned to them, and Judas. And here are the scriptures that spoke of that, and it had to be fulfilled. But in Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 25, and Jesus said to them, Oh, you foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary, according to the scriptures, that the, that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them all the scriptures concerning himself. Or Luke 24 and verse 44, and then Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, <laughs> from which Peter quotes, must be fulfilled. And verse 45, and then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And so Peter says in verse 16, brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For Judas was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Verse 20, for it's written in the book of Psalms, may his home become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. And then having said that, let another take his office. Peter addresses the issue of Judas' replacement. Indeed, perhaps it was at some point during that, those 40 days from the resurrection to the ascension that, that Jesus said something to them and told them that, uh, that this was a thing that needed to be done. We're not going to do it now. I'm with you and I'm getting done with you what I want to get done with you, but you'll have to do it after I'm gone. That there should be 12 apostles 
and not merely 11. Indeed, that there should be 12 apostles and not merely 11 was apparently no small matter in the grand scheme of things. Indeed, if you think about it, you know, that there, there, were, there were 12 tribes under the old covenant and there would be 12 apostles under the new covenant. In fact, Jesus had said something to the apostles before his passion and before his suffering. Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 28, Jesus said to them, and, and, and you are those who have stayed with me in my trials. You've stuck with me. And I have assigned to you, as the Father has assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. How could that happen with 11? Or the book of Revelation and John who was there this day listening to Peter say these things and probably because Peter and, and, and John did lots of things together as you read the book of Acts, John is probably saying, yep, yep. Yep, that's what Jesus said. That's. Of course, John wrote the Revelation, the 21st chapter, and beginning at verse 10, this was his testimony from the Isle of Patmos. And the angel carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Its radiance was like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. And it had a, a great high wall with 12 gates. And at the 12 gates, 12 angels and on the gates were the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And on the east there were three gates, and on the north there were three gates, and on the south there were three gates, and on the west there were three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And so having quoted Psalm 109 and verse 8, let another take his office, Peter addresses this issue of Judas' replacement. Notice verse 21, and so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, someone that was there for the whole three years, who saw everything that they saw, and experienced everything that they experienced because they were always tagging along. They weren't one of the 12, but as you read the Gospels, there's always more than, in fact, in, in, in one place it says, and Jesus sent 70 out to do ministry. And so one of the men, verse 21, who has accompanied us during all the time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John, that is, Jesus' baptism by John, until the day that he was taken up. That's a reference to the ascension. One of these men must become with us a witness to Jesus' resurrection. Verse 23, and so they put forth two. Apparently these two men, the logical, they couldn't choose between them. They did like, who? Joseph who's called Barsabbas. Barsabbas means son of the Sabbath. Maybe he was born on the Sabbath day. There's no explanation, but this guy, he's got two nicknames. So Bar, they, his name was Joseph. They called him Barsabbas, son of the, of, of the Sabbath. And then he had a non-Jewish name. They called him Justice. And then one man who only had one name. And that was Matthias. And so it was Joseph and Matthias. And it wasn't clear to them which one it should be. And so they prayed. Notice verse 24. And they prayed and they said, You, Lord. And I'm assuming that Curios, Lord, here is a reference to Jesus. I mean, he's the one who picks the apostles. And so they're making <clears throat> reference and asking his direction. And they prayed and said, Lord, you know the hearts of all. In fact, it's really interesting. The Greek word is heart knower. You're the heart knower. <laughs> 
You know what we don't know. Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside. Or as Peterson has it in the, in the message, who, who's this ministry that, that Judas threw away. You show us which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. That begs a question. Where is your place? Judas went to his place. Verse 26, and so they cast lots for these two. Now, a common method of casting lots in ancient times was to take stones and put some sort of marker on it. Maybe they, they took two stones and they put J, uh, J on one for Joseph and M on the other for Matthias or otherwise marked them to distinguish them. And so they, they take the stones, they drop them in a jug with a narrow neck, shake the jug, turn it upside down and cast the lot. And so the apostles prayed, in verse 26, and they cast the lots for Joseph and Matthias, and the lot fell to Matthias. And he was numbered, as verse 26 says, he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And so the number of the apostles was restored, readying them for the coming of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, which would happen just days later, and for the kingdom yet to come in all of its fullness, indeed, in the kingdom yet to come. One of the 12 foundation stones in the new Jerusalem will bear the name Matthias, which it would have seemed was God's plan all along. Indeed, notwithstanding its many trials and tribulations, the reason why the church survives and will ultimately be triumphant is because Jesus is its captain who has promised never to leave it or forsake it, who is still building it, and that no matter how many Judases should threaten to tear it apart. Amen? Amen. The resilience of the church. Let us pray. Sometimes we might be tempted to worry or maybe even feel a sense of depression when we look at the church and all of its difficulties, its struggles, leaders falling and failing people becoming disillusioned. But that's always been the case, seemingly. And yet you are there and you know what's going on. And you allow it to be tested and tried. You're purifying it even while it seems maybe in certain circumstances to, to be corrupt. question for us is that where are we standing in the midst of that? Are we part of its health or are we a part of its sickness? And we pray, Lord, that we would be a part of its health and even while we look and we see many aspects of sickness that we would trust in you and your word, your promise. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That is our hope. That is our hope, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.